Hare Krishna. Thank you for your patience today. And we are discussing uh, today on one of the philosophically critical as well as somewhat confusing concepts of the Gita. That is the concept of doership. That often we may have heard that we are not the doers. Then the next question comes up, then why are we held responsible if we are not the doers? So we'll be discussing that topic today. Uh, I'll be, it will be based on 1814 in the Bhagavad Gita. Adhishthanam tatha karta karanam cha prathak vidham vividhash cha prathak cheshta daivam chaivatra panchamam So Adhishthanam tatha karta so here is describing in the five factors that contribute to action. Adhishthanam is the field of action. That is the body, specifically karta, that is the doer. Karanam is the senses, the instruments of action. Chaprutak vidham, the different kinds of senses are there. Then vividhash chaprutak cheshta, and then different kinds of endeavors are there. Daivam chaivatra panchamam, and then the fifth is daiva, destiny. So let's look at this. So I'll be talking broadly today. Five broad conceptions. Now, I remember one of the first classes I heard was that, uh, or one of the first classes I gave was that, I, I was speaking about the verse 327 where it is said that, uh, to think that we are the doers is an illusion. So I said that if we think we are the doers, then that often leads to some kind of, if we are not the doers, if we hear that we are not the doers, then that raises many questions. So what questions are raised? So one devotee who was known to be quite uh, lethargic and always escaping responsibility, he said, if I'm not the doer, then why should I do anything at all? So then I said, okay, then if you should not do anything, then why eat at all? Now that is something which, so what gives us pleasure that we do, but that which causes us, which is required some effort, some sacrifice that we don't want to do. So what exactly does it mean that we are not the doers? Some people are literally so lazy uh, or we could say figuratively so lazy that if they were given the world championship award for laziness, they will ask, can it be home delivered? Mm -hmm. So now to say that we are not the doers, is that something which is meant, which is meant to rash justify lethargy? Not at all. So let's look at the session. Where we will start with discussing how does work relate with bondage. The point of doership is very strongly related with bondage. So how does work relate with bondage? Then we'll analyze action in terms of the five factors that are mentioned in this verse. Then what does being doer or non-doer actually mean? Then we will talk about action in terms of the modes. And, analyzing the, and then lastly, how the Gita, what it recommends is Non-doership in the sense of giving, uh, giving up, not action, but giving up the sense of attachment in action. So not renunciation of action, but renunciation in action. So let's uh, begin. Now, in today's world, from today's world, if we read the Vedic scriptures, the repeated emphasis on, on how we are entangled and how we need to be liberated, this can seem very strange because people say, where are we bound? What, what is this whole idea of bondage? And what, what is the idea of being uh, entangled and we want to be liberated? So is, is, is it a problem at all? So we can start off with, from a perspective that we can observe and then we can move forward. So where are we all bound? You now some of us, maybe some people get trapped in abusive relationships. 
Some people may have an exploitative boss. Now, if that is the only job we have and we don't have any alternative, we have to be there. Sometimes we are in certain relationships where, now abusive is a very broad word, but there may be very unpleasant relationships, but we are there in those, what do we do? Sometimes we ourselves may be bound by addictive habits. So not only some, some habits may not be ad addictive, they may be self-defeating. Now, what is the difference? Well, some people might be just addicted to caffeine, maybe addicted to TV watching, maybe addicted to things which are not considered uh, very harmless and which may not harm immediately. So self-defeating means people get into heavy drugs or they become alcoholics and destroy their health, destroy their life. So there are degrees. Now in today's world, even if we don't talk about bondage in terms of say slavery, physical slavery, which was present in many parts of the world in the past, but we are all experiencing around us a large amount of psychological entanglement, psychological bondage, which is what essentially any kind of addictive habit of self-defeating behavior is. And eventually, uh, when uh, people who get addicted, they may succumb to criminal behavior and they may be imprisoned for crime. So we could say that being imprisoned is very clearly, we'll see, okay, you're bound, you are limited. You, 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 are, you are limited in what you can do. So that is a very visible form of restriction of bondage. And when we are bound by our own behaviors, that may not be so easily visible. And, and when we are in particular relationships, that may or may not be visible depending on the way that relationship goes. But the fact is, we all do get bound at times. And uh, we don't want to be bound. At the same time, the nature of the world is that it, it entraps us. So many people nowadays don't get, want to get married because they feel that, not because they are detached or they want to pursue anything spiritual. They just feel that marriage is so entangling. But then what happens is, if they're not married, then they get entangled by loneliness or they get entangled in superficial relationships where they're just uh, pursuing one thing after another after another. So there is no easy way to escape the clutches of bondage in this world. So the overall entanglement, what the, what the Bhagavad Gita explains is of the soul with the world. So the soul is spiritual, but the soul gets bound in the world. Purusha, Prakriti Stohi, Bhungte Prakriti Jan Gunan, Karanam Gunasangosya, Sadasadyoni Janmasu. The soul does some actions, and as a result of those actions, the soul gets reactions. And by those reactions, the soul gets bound. So, what happens is, and this bondage of the soul to the world leads to the Janmamrityu Jara Vyadi, Dukkha Doshanu Darshanam. It leads to the repetition, uh, it leads to old age, disease, death, rebirth, and that cycle goes on and on. So basically, when we do actions, what are we driven to do the actions by? Purusha prakriti stohi, bhumte prakriti jan gunan. Because the soul desires to enjoy. And the desire to enjoy is what binds. So we are all in this way entangled. Now, all that I talked about earlier, I talked about, say, exploitative bosses or abusive relatives, abus abusive relatives or self-destructive habits or addictive habits or even prison. All that comes in the world. And we all get caught somewhere or the other in this world. But even if somebody is living free from any of these specific attachments or specific entanglements, still they're bound just because of having a body to go through inevitable sufferings. So generally when we talk about bondage, what do we mean a bondage or imprisonment or uh, any kind of incarceration? That means there is a restriction in freedom. So even in a prison, a person can move about, but within strict limits. 
so we would like to be we are all bound in terms of time we all would like to be young and healthy and active but as time passes we are all restricted more and more and it's a irreversible restriction it just we we can't do much against it so now if we consider the last bondage that if somebody is in jail then the two most important questions that a person will have is what got me here and how can i get out of here what got me here and how can i get out of here so these are the two questions that drive all spiritual philosophy especially spiritual philosophy as talked about in the vedic scriptures now other religious traditions also talk about uh, how the world is say for example the bible says the world is a veil of tears so their understanding is that we committed original sin and that's why we are trapped over here and we need the we need the saving by jesus grace so then we will be delivered something like that but all all spiritual traditions and especially the the dharmic spiritual traditions the bhagavad gita and other similar texts what got me here so what has got us entangled and how can we get out of this entanglement how so that these are driving questions and these driving questions answering them is what dry, what is the fuel of philosophy so what is the cause of entanglement so now this is the this is the background to how we come to the bhagavad gita now the bhagavad gita's 18 chapter last time we discussed the 17 chapter we discussed sensitivity in speech the 18 chapter begins with arjuna asking the same more or less the same question which is asked right at the beginning of the gita should i fight or should i not fight so what is better his question here is a little more is is understanding as evolved so his question is also evolved sometimes we think as we grow all our questions will become answered well yes many questions will be answered but as we grow in our spiritual understanding in our spiritual evolution then or as we evolve spiritually then our questions become subtler they are, they become more nuanced it's we we we, ne- we never become omniscient so we can never say that we will have no questions sometimes we may not have questions that we that that stir us so much that we need to ask them but arjuna has heard the gita and is he repeating the same question well yes but his question here is a little more nuanced so he asks what is the difference between renunciation and the renounced order mm-hmm. that is the essence of his question and that's what krishna will answer mm-hmm. based on using the concept of uh the doership and non doership so basically now what causes what binds us like i pre- just the previous diagram i also showed that it's the action which gives reaction that binds so arjuna's con- so arjuna's conception was that it is action that binds and krishna's clarification is that it is intention that binds so what we do doesn't entangle us why we do it entangles us and understanding this difference is critical for understanding what is the solution just like when we, if somebody has a disease diagnosing the disease is critical for giving the right treatment so yes we are entangled that's a disease but what is the cause of the disease so let's understand why is it it's why is intention to so critical so why intention matters so if we consider an action somebody is giving a charity and we say charity is a good thing to do but suppose somebody gives money to an alcoholic and why do why they give money to an alcoholic because say that alcoholic then what happens or rather what happens when they give they give money maybe the alcoholic just becomes more drunk and then the person goes and commits domestic violence and then what happens is now why is somebody giving Uh, say more uh, more money to for somebody to drink alcohol or say sometimes some drug peddlers give free drugs to initially at least why they because they want to control so the if the more somebody attached 
that the more that attachment becomes the means by which others can control them so suppose somebody is giving charity which is good but if their motivation is to make the alcoholic more addicted and more manipulable then is that charity really good charity is a good action but if the motivation is bad then it's not a good action and we can see the consequence also turns out to be bad so on the other hand if somebody shoots someone to death say that's that's cruel that's brutal but suppose that person was a serial killer and when that person is killed society is freed from that person and the motivation for killing is also to establish order in society then killing normally would consider to be bad but here is this is this killing really bad no if this is required for establishing order in society and that's why it is done then it is not only uh, it it is we could say it is essential to do it so there are two extreme examples of how actions that are apparently good may be ill motivated and actions that are apparently bad may be well motivated so <clears throat> now this principle that our intention determines uh, the essence of our action and that's why in, our intention determines whether we get entangled or not so that is the first point which we discussed till now how does work relate with bondage it is not work that binds firstly we discussed we are all bound but it is not work that binds it is the motivation with which we do the work it is our intention that binds and that brings us to the section second section now action analyzed in terms of the five factors so what are the five factors there is adhishthanam tatha karta the place of action then there is a performer that is a karta karanam cha prathak vidha that is the senses vividhash cha prathak cheshta that is the endeavor and daivam chaivatra panchamam daiva can refer to the to the higher beings which are ultimately supervised under the supreme being the super soul so a destiny and the lord of destiny now these five factors let's take some take a take a simple example a sports example to understand this so let's suppose somebody is somebody there's a cricket match going on and there's a batsman who goes over there so the field of action is the adhishthanam so what is that it can refer to the body of the batsman it can refer to the cricket pitch where the action is going to happen so basically the field of action so now why does it matter say if if the body is injured or the pitch is water logged then then the batsman can't perform over there so when we say five factors of action what krishna means is that these are the five factors which contribute to action and and then eventually the result comes out now of course in this case the soul is the karta the batsman so now imagine if a person is dead sometimes it happens that uh, in the cricket field somebody gets a heart attack and dies or sometimes in the cricket field somebody might get injured and they may die so in australia i think a year or two ago a batsman was killed because of being hit by a bouncer on a vulnerable part of the head so then the batsman might be in good form the fielder might be alert but if there there if the soul leaves the body then nothing can be done then there are the instruments of action now the difference between the field of action and the instruments of action is that for particular activities particular senses are especially important say for a singer the throat is especially important for a surgeon maybe the fingers are extremely important for a batsman the arms are important for for various people like that for various activities particular senses are important and if those senses are not functioning and the action can't be done so the batsman might be overall fit but if the hand is sprained then the person can't the batsman can't bat so 
that is the so that's also required for action that if you move forward beyond that endeavor is required endeavor here uh, refers to the, the batsman has to practice there is nets practice and then before that training and before that there are so many years of coaching and uh, workouts so why is all that needed because that's what makes a person better so if somebody is a average batsman they will at least become a decent batsman and if somebody is a talented batsman that person will become excellent batsman so talent means it's more potential excellence means that potential has been transformed into actuality okay. now beyond that mm, destiny can refer to the you all the other factors that that shape the results that can come into the picture but that are not in our control that are other than these three these three four so for example now it's simply the we could say it's destiny that the pandemic has happened and sports stopped for quite a few months uh, inter air travel stopped tourism stopped so many things stopped so everything else might be conducive but something something things can just break down so uh, for any action to produce its results multiple factors need to come together now now i'm i'm going to link these two points our first point was that it is by being getting bound is a problem and what binds is the motivation is the intention so that same point is being analyzed from a different perspective that actually we are only one of the factors in action so let's look at this so so at the five factors of action we understood now let's look at the point of the uh, doership and non doership what does it mean hmm. so now is the soul the doer if you consider those five factors of action and we also consider overall experience by soul means are we the doers so well one way of looking at it would be if you put it in terms of pendulum that yes certainly that that would be the normal common sense kind of answer if i don't do things they won't happen so if if someone doesn't cook at home there will be no food and we can think of hundreds of things which if they are not done they don't happen if the police don't maintain law and order then then law and order doesn't stay in the material world there is the principle of entropy entropy means that sakale neha mahata yogo nashtah parantapa things degrade by the passage of time so even some, if something is well situated it doesn't say well situated so what is well situated will become situated in a well in a deep dark well of material existence uh, after some time so things have to be done otherwise they don't happen so especially with respect to somebody trying to do something constructive or maintain something constructive now that's one way of looking at it is yes, of course we are the doers mm-hmm. say so you say you all of you chose to come here to come online to attend this talk i chose to give this talk and if we ha- if we had none this then this class wouldn't happen so we are the doers that's we could say uh, to argue against it by saying we are not the doers that doesn't seem very sensible but at the same time we could go to the other side and say if i am the doer then you know, when i do things things should happen but do they always happen no they don't happen all the time even when we do something that something is done for a particular purpose that may not happen hmm. so sometimes we may not even be able to do the action what to speak of producing the result so if you consider the five factors of action the soul is here then we could say the body the senses the endeavor and destiny and then the result daiva so now sometimes what happens is we may do everything so we may have a fit body we may have a, a the trained senses we may have put in the this uh, we may have ta- we could have talent talent as a ability then we have put in the endeavor 
all that is there but destiny is not there then the results may not come sometimes some people they just don't get the lucky breaks in their lives although they have talent but they but they the talent never becomes uh, known to the world so there are there are stories of famous artists famous poets famous writers but they died paupers and after that their works became celebrated and now their works are sold phenomenally especially with respect to some artists but it was their just the destiny was not there for them to get fame or wealth or whatever so sometimes we may do the action but the result may not come hmm? and sometimes the action itself may not be able to be done so if the as i said the batsman might go and bat but if say suddenly a big storm comes the match gets stopped or cancelled and the result doesn't come although the batsman is batting very well sometimes the batsman gets injured and the batsman can't bat itself so then even the action doesn't happen what to speak of the result so either way the point is that uh, we if we just live in the world for some time we start seeing that you know i can't i can't make things happen all the time so the so we could say there is truth to both sides if i don't do things things don't happen but even when i do things things don't happen on many occasions so then the balanced understanding would be that we are a doer but not the sole doer the doer in the sense that the singular doer so our role is contributive it is not decisive we may be there we may be put in our effort but that doesn't necessarily mean the results will come now about some people it is said that they never take no for an answer and that's how some people are glorified no actually that's simply a lie no everybody has to take no for an answer even if somebody becomes super successful in one area of life they it is very unlikely that they chose that area at the first go and that they had to they tried something it didn't work out they tried something in that area also it's not that suddenly everything works out so we have to take no for an answer now we may not take no as the ultimate answer and some people may keep persevering so that is that that is a different issue but the point is that just because we desire to do something things don't necessarily happen so our role is contribute to this is not decisive and that is what the point of talking about doership is that we are not the sole doers and this in fact is what the bhagavad gita also speaks if you look at the gita on doership we'll see again if you put this uh, so the previous pendulum was more in terms of logical or observational analysis now let's do a scriptural analysis so this is the verse which is quite well known from the gita prakrte kriyamanani gunai karmani sarvashah ahankara vimudhatma karta aham iti manyate so prakrte kriyamanani it is, so what is it everything is done by the modes of material nature gunai karmani sarvashah all of it and ahankara vimudhatma because of arrogance the soul becomes deluded and starts think karta aham iti manyate the soul thinks that i am the doer so this is one verse which is quite often quoted to talk about how uh, to that we are not the doers however the gita is not exactly saying that what it is saying that think that you are the doer is is an arrogant delusion and there is another perspective in the gita also if we consider at the end of the gita uh, krishna tells arjuna ethechasi tatha kuru in 1863 says now do as you desire so kuru kuru means to do kuru is a variant it comes from the same root from which comes karta so kuru and karta are very related not only that not only does krishna tell arjuna do as you desire so how can arjuna do if he is not a doer 
and krish arjuna also responds 10 verses later by saying karishe vachanam tava i will do your will so he is telling that yes karishe i will do so if to think that we are the doers of illusion then why is krishna endorsing a uh, krishna asking arjuna to do something illusory and why is arjuna agreeing to do that and arjuna has said karishe vachanam tava just after he has said that krishna by your words my moha is destroyed nashto moha smriti labdha tat prasadan maya chuta sito smigata sandeha karishe vachanam tava so he said that krishna i have heard your words and my illusion is destroyed nashto moha smritir labdha my memory has been restored and tat prasadan by your mercy and therefore i will do your will so i will do so he is saying that i will do so that that's not illusion because he is saying that categorically i will free from illusion and now i will do so what is the understanding if you want to look at a balanced understanding is that do but no you are not the sole doer so in 1816 1814 was the five factors of action 1816 is a critical verse we don't quote it very often but it it reconciles this idea of doership and non doership what it says is tatraivam sati kartaram atmanam kevalam tu yah pashyatya krita buddhitvan nasa pashyati durmati hi so tatraivam sati kartaram that kartaram those who think tatraivam sati kartaram atmanam kevalam tu yah one who thinks i am the sole doer atmanam kevalam kevala is only that i am the sole doer so what happens to such a person pashyatya akrita buddhitvan such a person sees without intelligence that person's vision is very superficial nasa pashyati durmati hi and that person is actually not seeing because their conscience consciousness is misdirected consciousness sees only superficial things and so the so the point is we are the doers in the sense that we have to do but we are not the sole doers and understanding that we are not the sole doers brings humility it also brings detachment detachment because it helps us understand that that i am not the i am not the produce sole producer of the result so sometimes the result will come sometimes the result may not come and understanding this so are we the doers yes we are but not the sole doers so to think we are the sole doers is the illusion so karta ahmiti manyate means in the context of the gita krishna is telling arjuna arjuna i think you are thinking that you will not fight this war okay that's one way of looking at it but you know you are not entirely free you have a particular kind of body that the body is of the kshatriya and that kshatriya body will push you to act in a particular way and you may not fight now but eventually if somebody provokes you you see that injustice somewhere you will want to fight so now this is where arjuna krishna tells arjuna you have a particular set of modes within you and they will push you to act in a particular way so i discussed about doer and non doer and now we move to action analyze in terms of modes now this is a i'm going to do a very quick overview over here and maybe in a future sessions we will discuss some of these uh, components of action and um, in terms of the modes further so in the 17th chapter faith is analyzed in terms of three modes so faith is the basis of action based on what we believe we will do something so now based on say now with the pandemic all around some people say that we have to just lock down everything otherwise we'll die and others say no we can't lock down you know we have to life has to move on and even if some people become sick most people will recover some people will well there is no safety in life so now it is what is what is it that people have faith in some people have faith in 
faith in the dangerousness of the disease and the utter utter dangerousness of the disease that that is the basis of their action what is their action lockdown no action for others they have faith in maybe the maybe the immunity of the human system the resilience of the human spirit or uh, the necessity of activity and social get together and profession whatever so they say that no we have to act so everything that we do uh, it can be anal- our actions are based on faith whatever kind of action that we do so here faith is used in a very inclusive sense it doesn't just refer to religious faith although that's an important part of it but our f- faith is the basis of our actions and so 17 chapter analyzes faith in terms of three modes so if you want to assess our actions what the what the 17 chapter does is basically 17 chapters starting question is there are some people who follow scripture they become elevated other people reject scripture they are faithless some people faithfully follow scripture and they are elevated some people faithless reject scripture and they are degraded so what about people who are faithful but not to scripture they have some kind of faith but not mm, faith in scripture so what happens to them so there are people now there are some there are some people who have been believing or claiming many many social thinkers and others they claim for a long time that as science advances religion will regress and religion will die god is dead frederick nietzsche has said so they now they have been predicting the death of god for over 150 years but it's not happened and one reason is that people have recognized that religious society uh, many thinkers are saying that religion serves certain needs and those needs are important for people we are not just rational creatures you know we are actually meaning seeking creatures and rational uh, is a big subject i won't go into it rationality may provide us some small sense of meaning okay why do like this why does this fruit fall from fruit fall from a tree why do the plants move like this but what is the meaning of life rationality doesn't give us any answer to that so basically uh, the point i'm making is that even atheists have started recognizing the utility of religion in fact there are atheists who have written books on why religion matters so there are and these atheists are basically saying that okay we need to uh, we need to counter the extremist elements within religion we don't i don't accept religion but i know that religion has a social value so there are some people who talk about i don't have belief in god but i have belief in belief i have belief in belief in god that means belief in god benefits people although god may or may not exist and i even think that god doesn't exist but belief in god benefits people so and the, as far as the medical evidence is concerned it's undeniable the people who have not just belief in god but belief expressed in some kind of actions they are healthier they rec- they they are healthier in terms of physical health they recover faster from sicknesses and their mental health of course they are sturdier the oxford handbook of science and religion it combined 2000 studies from all over the world for this purpose so the point i'm making here is that faith doesn't have to be directly in scripture directly in god but faith can be of various kinds so faith so everything that a person does we we talk about motivation earlier motivation refers to the more of the specific intention why we are doing something but that intention also arises from one's world view or which which is founded in one's faith so how do we know what is the motivation of a particular person not just the motivation of a particular action but the overall driving motivation of their life so for that we have to assess their actions and how do we assess their actions we look at their key actions so that's the 17 chapter talks about what kind of food do we eat what kind of austerity do we perform what kind of charity do that we give what kind of sacrifice that we do so yagya dana tapa these are the ways by which we we interact with the three cosmic cycles in which we are encased three cycles there is the body is a physical cycle or not a cycle circle the physical circle in which you are situated in society so for the body some austerity is required the body may want to sleep as much as it likes the body may want to eat as much as it likes the body may want to 
indulge in sensuality as much as it likes but some austerity is required so then for the society charity is required and for the ultimate reality now we understand we are part of a higher reality we need to cooperate we need to sacrifice so basically so how one is interacting with the broader world that shows their level of faith and krishna in the 17th chapter actually talks about the three modes this goodness passion ignorance he talks about food in the three modes then talks about austerity in the three modes he talks about charity in the three modes he talks about sacrifice in the three modes so like that we that was the 17th chapter so again why are we discussing this our discussion is why do what causes bondage its motivation why motivation because ultimately the results are not in our action in our control even the actions may not be in our control because say somebody wants to say somebody wants to speak but they have a bad throat and they can't speak mm-hmm. now they're not able to do the action so now if they wanted to speak some horrible foul words they wanted to speak some heart breaking words to others now they they were not able to speak it but that malicious intention is there in their heart and maybe that will come out later if it is there that still indicates that there is some amount of envy there is some amount of arrogance there is some amount of greed whatever so that is there that's why they had those kind of words they they had the thought to speak those kind of words so it's our action that ma- uh, it's because even our action is not in our control what to speak of the results uh, the action being expressed in a particular way so it's motivation that matters and what kind of actions would we want to do what are likely to be our driving motivations those are shaped by the modes so in this way krishna is analyzing for arjuna um not the particular actions but the underlying motivations for those actions and based on that krishna is telling you that these are the motivations you need to change then you will be free from bondage so now interestingly when arjuna asks about the renounced order uh, tyaga and sanyasa now now these words have been translated differently by different commentators in the gita and um, the key principle over there is that krishna says that even something like renunciation can be in the three modes so like we discussed the normal conception of is that okay we are entangled and why are we entangled because it is action that entangles us and then if i give up action i'll be free from entanglement no krishna says even you are giving up of action can be in three modes so that's the amazing thing say i'm acting in three modes but my giving up of action can also be in the three modes so how can that be so what is renunciation in ignorance krishna talks about in 189 then there 188 is renunciation in passion and 187 is renunciation in goodness so what are these three renunciations so moha tasya parityaga tamasa parikirtita krishna says when one gives up because of Ill- illusion or irresponsibility that is action in the mode of ignorance if somebody gives up because it's troublesome kaya klesha bhayat tejet oh so much hard work now everybody needs to work hard that's just the nature of the world avidya kama karma bhi that's the nature of the world the bhagavatam says so but somebody just gives up important responsibilities because it's troublesome then that is renunciation see normally we think of renunciation we will we'll not associate renunciation with the mode of passion but how we can connect the two is normally the mode of passion is concerned with pleasure with enjoyment so whatever gives me enjoyment i will go to any extent to get it and if i am pleasure seeking then i am also constantly avoiding the opposite of pleasure that is trouble or pain so if I, the, to the extent i am pleasure seeking then i also be i am also pain avoiding and then that means if some of my duties some of my responsibilities they cause me pain why do that but if somebody has a higher purpose in their life 
then yes there is pleasure there is pain but they will persevere somebody um, gives up a relationship so so they give up a relationship why because it's too troublesome well okay that may well be in the mode of passion that means we, we didn't see the relationship as a uh, responsibility that will gradually help us grow okay this is troublesome get rid of it so that's why we'll see that you know when the relationships are entered into in the mode of passion then they are also given up in the mode of passion so giving up because of trouble or discomfort that is in the mode of passion and goodness is uh, renunciation the good of good, mode of goodness krishna says it is not giving up action so much as giving up worldly association and attachment when we give these up that is what will free us from bondage so the inner inner motivation to want to enjoy the things of this world uh, to or to push others down in this world so so that they don't get to enjoy and then i'll get to enjoy all this is a solution as comes because of association and attachment so if somebody avoids that then they can act also but they will not be entangled that is the idea over here so krishna is telling arjuna that if you truly want to be renounced don't just give up action give up give up worldly association give up attachment and the whole bhagavad gita is spoken to spoken to come to this level now of course to go higher than this level also but broadly from this foundation move higher up it just like if there is a if there is a 100 story building well it is already on on the 10th store uh, so somebody in the 100 floor house then they are already on the 10th floor it's further above the 10th floor so giving up worldly association attachment is the mode of goodness and krishna's instruction will we go further above that to higher and higher levels so there is the three modes and many other things can also be in the three modes so there are the factors of action which are the five factors of action we discussed earlier in 16 in 1814 the verse we recited but now krishna also analyzes action in other ways in the 18th chapter so in the 17th chapter we discuss analysis of faith in terms of three modes then when arjuna is talk asking about renunciation first thing krishna says is even giving up of action is also an action within the three modes and then he starts analyzing when we are acting what do we do there are various factors that are involved so there is knowledge we whenever we want to do something we have some knowledge so for example now if the vaccine comes up for the for covid now most people are eager to get a vaccine some people are apprehensive maybe this vaccine is not tested very well we should not take it we should take it so it depends on the knowledge that we have that we we choose particular desires sometimes we may say that oh but i have knowledge still i choose certain desires well that is because that other kind of knowledge which reminds me at that time at least in the spur of the moment how much pleasure is there in fulfilling that desire that's what is making me do that so knowledge is always there an alcoholic may resolve in their sober moments i'll not drink again and then they may drink but because at that time that is the kind of knowledge that comes in matta smritir gyanam apohanam cha in 1515 the bhagavata krishna says it is based on our desires he gives us knowledge also so knowledge can also be in the three modes now this is a fascinating analysis and we can't go into it at this stage in today's class but uh, when we act we have certain kind of certain kind of conceptions of how the world is and what we are meant to do in it so that is knowledge then after that we do some action because so the action can be in the three modes then the actor the person who is working they can be in the three modes then after that even the intelligence can be in the three modes now krishna differentiates between knowledge and intelligence broadly we are talking about knowledge as perception as taking in information from the world and he talks about intelligence in terms of how we act in the world so how we regulate our senses or how we indulge in our senses um, all that so more of taking in information is associated with knowledge acting is in term acting in the world and how not just we act but what are the kind of thinking that goes behind acting that is called as intelligence then there is determination 
I may have intelligence. Okay, this is what I want to do. This or this is what is good for me. So we may start it, but we may not continue it. We may make very some very good New Year resolutions, but then after a fifteen days or after a month, well, they may just fall by the wayside. And many people, quite often, uh, they take the same resolutions every year. Why? Because they couldn't keep it. So determination, and then after that, there is happiness. So ultimately, we are doing things because we want pleasure, and there are different kinds of pleasure. So Krishna, in this way, analyzes the subject threadbare to help Arjuna appreciate how complicated things are. And it's not just simple. Just give up action, and then you will be liberated. Not so simple. So now the last part, I will just quickly mention it today, and we'll discuss it in a future session. That is, so how exactly does one get liberated? So we discussed till now about action analyzed in terms of three modes. So renunciation in action, not renunciation of action. That means Krishna is telling Arjuna that cultivate the inner mood of detachment from worldly association, from worldly worldly aspirations, and then that is the healthiest way of renunciation. The defining question of the Gita is: Should I renounce action, or should we act without renunciation? We just act in the world like everybody else acts. So the Bhagavad Gita action answer is that. Outer action with inner renunciation, outer action with inner renunciation, and karma yoga is one level of outer action where there is some amount of detachment. In fact, the Bhagavad Gita will talk also about work as worship, which I will talk in the next session. I won't go into this now; we don't have time for this. So, how do we disentangle ourselves by make your motivation more and more selfless? Do work for some higher cause. So, Arjuna. don't think that you are fighting to gain the kingdom you are fighting to establish dharma in the society you are fighting to please me ultimately so as our motivation becomes more and more selfless then our actions become less and less entangling so karma yoga is where we are detached from the fruits of the work there is bhagavat arpit karma yoga where we do we are not only are we detached from the fruits of work that we do that means i don't want these fruits but i want to offer those fruits to the lord so that is karma yoga offered to krishna or bhagavat arpit karma yoga and what happens in that is krishna takes the karma and gives us the yoga the karmic entanglement that comes from that karma krishna takes that and the connection with transcendence that happens in the practice of yoga that krishna rewards us and beyond karma yoga is bhakti yoga now these various yoga this yogas and the yoga ladder in a conclusive sense it's mentioned in the 18th chapter and we will discuss this but right now we're just focusing on the principle of uh, how we become disentangled from the world so the more selfless our motivation the less and less is the bondage and ultimately if our motivation is bhakti yoga which means to please the lord so we work on behalf of krishna for his pleasure and there is no question of entanglement at all that is the gita's ultimate teaching and when krishna says to arjuna yathechita kuru and arjuna replies karishye vachanam tava krishna is acting at the level of bhakti simply being an instrument of krishna and therefore there is no entanglement for him so gita's conclusion is arjuna you don't have to change your occupation you are a, you are a kshatriya you don't have to become a brahmana you don't have to become a sadhu but changing your motivation is the whole gita is spoken to help arjuna raise his consciousness and change his motivation and that is something which we all can do by studying the bhagavad gita and learning to apply it in whatever situation we may be in life so today i summarize now we discussed broadly speaking we discuss the topic of if we are not the doers then why are we held responsible so in the i discuss this in five parts first is that we may say we are not the doers but what exactly is going on so first part i discussed is that 
everybody is entangled in some way or the other be it in in one's own habits in some relationships or some people are incarcerated also so if somebody is bound then two questions what got me here and how can i get out of here so those are the questions that drive serious philosophy and the bhagavad gita is also driven by those questions uh, so then the conventional understanding is that our actions bind now i got into this relationship and that's how i got bound or i started indulging in this thing and now it's it's got me so it's our actions that bind well yes it's true but it's not the complete truth it's not so much the action that binds but the motivation behind the action that binds i talk about somebody giving charity to an alcoholic charity seems good but to an alcoholic it it may be ill motivated and somebody might be a kill a person but if the if it's a police killing a criminal a serial killer then then it's good so not so much the action but the intention behind the action that matters and why is it like that we discuss the five factors of action using the example of a cricket match and concluded that what to speak of getting the results is not in our control even doing the action itself is not in our control because sometimes the senses may not work sometimes the intelligence may not work so sorry sometimes the body itself may not be functional so therefore it is again what we want to do that reflects our level of consciousness and that will eventually shape our consciousness also then okay then it comes to what we want what what are our, our basic desires that we discussed in terms of the three modes so in the 17th chapter krishna talks about three modes in terms of the how even faith is in three modes so there are those who are faithful to scripture and devoted to and they get elevated those who are faithless and they faithless in reject scripture and they are degraded but what about those who are faithful but not to scripture so then we talked about in contemporary terms the word belief in belief or even belief in belief in god so i ha- so some people accept the social utility of religion the psychological utility of religion and medical science also seems to support that so then we discussed about how faith applies universally to all actions and it can be seen through what we eat what we uh, how we perform yagya dana tapa then even giving up an action is an action within the three modes that's how krishna talks about renunciation and then the various factors of action uh, various not factors very components of action knowledge action actor intelligence determination and happiness and the idea is for us to become entangled we need to make our motivation as selfless as possible so karma yoga is one level of selflessness karma yoga offered to krishna is even higher and bhakti yoga is the highest and the key thing krishna tells arjuna is that we discussed also earlier about you are not the doer in the sense that you are not the sole doer but you have to do it is your responsibility and krishna and arjuna also says yes i will do so the idea is work for a higher motivation not simply to get back at those who have offended you not just to get a kingdom but to establish dharma to do your dharma in kshatriya to establish dharma in society and to ultimately please the supreme lord so when one works at that level then there is no question of entanglement at all we don't have to give up our occupations but we do have to change our change our uh, uh, conceptions we have to purify our motivations so thank you very much hare krishna are there any questions uh which slide did you want to see vamsi vamsi guntur prabhu yes prabhu that uh, uh, by mores right faith in the faith analyzed in terms of mores okay so so when should we renounce uh in action well yes before we do an action we pray usually after we do the action we thank so now during action how much do we remember it depends now as we become more and more devoted to the lord we'll remember that more and more maybe uh, before we are not that devoted then we will not remember that much 
in general in our lives when we are doing things in the early years of our life or in the early stages of doing some things we are very caught in the externals mm-hmm. but as we keep doing them more and more the externals become yeah we become more familiar with them and then we can focus on the internals so what i am what i am doing is more important initially for people then why am i doing it that becomes more and more important say if somebody that somebody is giving a public talk for the first time and they are very self conscious oh i am speaking so many people what will people think of me i want to impress them well okay but as they keep speaking then what happens is they start realizing that now why am i here why am i speaking that starts becoming more and more important so for us as we practice bhakti more and more then krishna will become more and more important the world will be important but not so important and then even while engaging in the world krishna will be there in the background of our consciousness and he will come more and more to the foreground so yes at least before and after it is a, it is good to uh, renounce that means not to renounce in the sense that i am not doing this but rather narayana eti samarpayami kaye namanasa that was famous you know that whatever i am doing with my body my intelligence i offer it all to the lord okay so let's move on to the so, so can you see the slide number uh, renunciation in the three modes the first term was a little change yeah so yeah, in this slide when, uh, when can one go, uh, sorry 8.8.7 8.7 is a ignorance is it, is it that, that watch number you mentioned uh, i think it is reverse can check recheck 8.7 is ignorance or 8.9 is boldness 18.9 that's interesting so you saying goodness passion ignorance everywhere else krishna does go takes other sequence Mm. Okay. Everywhere else is from eighteen point twenty to eighteen point thirty nine. It's all goodness, passion, ignorance, goodness, passion, ignorance. But here it is ignorance, passion, goodness. In the seventeen chapter also it is goodness, passion, ignorance, goodness, passion, ignorance throughout. First foods in goodness, then in passion, then in ignorance. First austerity in goodness, then in passion, then in ignorance. Interesting. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. Mm. Okay, so what was the question here? I'm just losing the question. So, what is mature renunciation according to the Gita? What is the balance for the practitioner and perfectional stage? What is yukta vairagya? Well, yukta vairagya means that. that we recognize that we are in the world and for functioning in the world we have to interact with the world so then we engage in the world for the purpose of purification for the purpose of elevation now we may say that our motives are not that pure right now so yes if we consider yukta vairagya for us the word yukta means connected connected with the supreme lord and renunciation is renounced from uh, so we become detached from the world because of that yukta vairagya so now yukta also mm, is a variant of yoga mm? and yukta also leads to yukti yukti is idea mm? yoga is the practice of yoga that connects so what happens is that when we talk about yukta vairagya the mind comes up with various ideas for gratification and to the extent the mind becomes kamar yogas chitta vritti nirodha the practice of yoga leads to the cessation of the material agitations of the mind and uh, then one becomes more and more detached so it's a gradual process that means it's not black and white so at whatever level we are at you know we try to be as honest as possible so now suppose somebody is sick then there is much that they can't do which other people can do if somebody had a fracture 
and you know for them now even to move the hand a little bit is painful but you know when they are moving the hand there is bearable pain and there is unbearable pain now if they don't take up the bearable pain they will never recover but at the same time if they start taking up unbearable pain then the healing won't happen and then also they won't recover so now who tells them who decides what is bearable pain when the doctor will encourage them the physiotherapist or whoever you know, now you should exercise hmm. do this much but ultimately every patient recovers differently their body is different their minds are different so now the idea is if the patient wants to recover then the patient has to take up bearable pain and uh, be, uh, so like we talk about the comfort zone the stretch zone and the panic zone so you know we all as we are moving forward in our lives if we want to grow spiritually we need to take up some level of bearable pain bearable pain means some things there are some things which uh, give us comfort and pleasure and thinking of giving them up it's impossible for us and there are some things which give us comfort and pleasure and with some effort we can give them up or at least we can regulate them we can reduce them so we have to find out what is a bearable level of pain for us and we accept that so for us yukta vairagya uh, to say that nirbandha krishna sambandha yukta vairagya uchyate but we do we don't have that nirbandha right now we do uh, that complete detachment from the world or a strong attachment to the supreme lord neither of them we have right now so what do we do that is our aspiration that is the perfectional stage at our level we engage in the world not just because we want to engage, want to please krishna to or serve krishna through the world we want to engage in the world because we also have desires but don't increase those desires more than uh, what is already present don't pander to them more than what is necessary now what is necessary that is something which requires individual introspection and honesty is like i talked about bearable pain so i would say that that uh, if we are trying to do some amount of disciplining and austerity according to our capacity then we are uh, we are on the path of uh, mature renunciation so match, so for in this context you now for a patient to just lie comfortably in bed and have nurse and others take care of them that's that's comfortable but then they have to recover they have to renounce that comfort so that they can gain health so similarly for us there is a certain amount of comfort in material existence of course material existence also gives a lot of problems but still there is some amount of comfort so we have to renounce that comfort but how much that is a bearable amount of pain we need to take that's how we can understand yukta vairagya at our level I think we can. There are lots of questions. I think I can take one or two more. If a grahastha doesn't want, wants to preach vigorously but doesn't have sufficient resources at this point, and doesn't have much organizational support, so if grahastha want to preach, do they? But they are not financially strong. What should they do? Should they postpone their preaching till they get sufficient resources? well it doesn't have to be one zero preaching doesn't have to be full time preaching one can start doing some kind of service some kind of sharing of krishna bhakti wherever one is and as uh, one's financial financial security increases then one can decrease the involvement over there and increase one's uh, involvement in krishna service so i would say rather than make it one zero make it analog do what we can don't uh, neglect the financial side but at the same time don't postpone the spiritual side so basically in general one principle we can keep in mind is that uh, when we use everything that we have in krishna's service krishna gives us much more mm-hmm. and if we are not using what we have in krishna service then krishna will say 
why should i give you more and even if we krishna gives us more probably we will use it for for worldly purposes for sensual purposes that's why yes we we can't uh, we are not in a situation where we can neglect our financial responsibilities at the same time we don't have to make it one zero hmm. then okay so if we now we, we are all pleasure seeking and we want to go to the spiritual world because um, the material world is a place of misery and we want to go to the spiritual uh, the spiritual world is a place of happiness then if you are working toward that is that renunciation in the mode of passion uh, not exactly although possibly it can be so the idea is that a devotee is not even really concerned about pleasure a devotee is concerned about love loving krishna serving krishna and in that love and service there is great joy but if a devotee is simply concerned about pleasure then it's not going to work it's why is it not going to work because you know, service to krishna requires effort in the bhagavad gita in the ninth chapter krishna is talking about the topmost devotees is 9:13 he says they are mahatmanas tumam partha they are great souls because daivam prakriti mashrita bhajanti ananya manaso gyatva bhutadi mauvem they they worship krishna with undiverted devotion and their their, their minds are also not diverted to krishna ananya manaso because they know krishna is be all the be all and end all gyatva bhutadi mauvem and yet in the next verse krishna says 9:14 दृढ़व्रता So, if somebody's mind is already attracted toward Krishna, it's not diverted by anything. Then why do they have to endeavor with great determination? Because doing anything in this world is not easy. Effort is required for that. And if somebody is simply pleasure seeking, then they will not be able to do any service to Krishna substantially. If Prabhupada had been pleasure seeking, then he could have just stayed in Vrindavan and enjoyed Krishna consciousness there. When he came to America, there was a lot of trouble in coming to America. he came because there was a higher purpose so so rather than thinking in terms of you know does that mean that we should not seek pleasure at all no it's not that it's again it's not like digital logic uh, uh, one or zero it is that uh, we all need pleasure we cannot live without pleasure but at the same time uh, you know what are we seeking pleasure from there are also levels of pleasure so there is pleasure where i just gratify my senses and the world go to hell there is pleasure where you know i take up my responsibilities and i get some pleasure i make some contribution and there is the, the highest level of reciprocation with is with krishna so for devotees we just we all want to go to the spiritual world but we want to go to the spiritual world because there we can we can reciprocate love with krishna without any of the distractions and uh, tribulations of this world as for a, for a devotee the troubles of the world are troubles because primarily because they distract one from service to krishna yes old age disease death these are all troubles now they are troubles because the devotee just wants to serve the lord and a devotee has no desire to gratify the senses and oh because of old age i lost my ability to gratify my senses that's not the devotee's desire so yes so, so we want to go to the spiritual world and at one level any reason if we want to go toward that that is good but if our purpose is simply pleasure if we are driven only by pleasure then we start maybe start finding that even the association of devotees even in the practice of bhakti there is so much trouble so why am i doing this 
If I want pleasure, maybe the world is offering me better pleasure. So yes, so we want to. It's not exactly renunciation in the mode of passion, but it's somewhere near that. We need to come to a higher level of understanding that there is definitely supreme pleasure, but a devotee is not looking for pleasure. A devotee is looking for service, and that's what is what's what defines a devotee. Okay, this is a complicated question. How much time do we have? Mm -hmm. I think your question is quite uh, okay. Let me see if I can find something here. Have we discussed in any of our sessions about, say, categorical and contextual ethics? So the question here is that. Uh, is motivation that matters action doesn't matter so but if somebody somebody accidentally does something wrong then will they not be culpable for it if somebody is acting according to spiritual master's instruction will they be free from all karma because of that well in the context of the bhagavad gita the important point for arjuna is that he is fighting a war and he has to fight it for the practice of dharma so every scripture or every book is spoken in a particular context so now that context shapes the entire narrative now if you there was another question which i will answer address briefly that you know does the bhagavad gita talk about renouncing the world at all well not much Now, if somebody wants to talk about that we should become brahmacharis and sanyasis based on the bhagavad gita well you will not find many verses supporting that idea in the bhagavad gita why all the bhagavad gita is talking about universal principles of 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 spirituality at the same time it is spoken at a particular place and for a particular purpose that is for arjuna he already wanted to renounce the world but his renouncing the world would be contrary to the purpose of dharma contrary to the plan of the lord and from that perspective the whole bhagavad gita as spirituality is more world engaging world transforming not so much world transcending world rejecting the bhagavatam spirituality is much more world rejecting because parikshit maharaj has already decided that i am not going to counter this curse i want to accept it now all that i want to do is transcend become absorbed in the lord so most of the stories in the bhagavatam are about how great souls renounce the world and attain perfection the chetanya charitamrita also like that uh, so each book has its 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 driving spirit its ethos so so from the bhagavad gita's perspective the renunciation is not talked about much so similar so so the in the bhagavad gita's perspective why am i talking about this that from the bhagavad gita's perspective krishna's whole purpose is to tell arjuna motivation is what matters action doesn't matter but is that a absolutely universal statement no action does matter mm -hmm. so we could say whenever a person does some actions there is uh, there is the intention there is the action and there is a consequence all three matter so what we do why we do and what results by what we do all three matter in terms of one's culpability so now somebody may say uh, so if somebody accidentally does something wrong are they culpable well yes it depends on what wrong has happened and yes yeah, say somebody shoot somebody accidentally well it depends there is some amount of culpability karma is gahana karma karma is quite uh, subtle and complicated so we can't really figure it out simplistically but we can broadly understand principles and you could say that when when we are following the spiritual master's instruction now what does it mean to follow the spiritual master's instruction 
The spiritual master doesn't just give us one instruction. There are many instructions that are given. In fact, uh, one instruction is just be responsible, be intelligent. Prabhupada said Krishna consciousness means common sense. So, <clears throat> at one time some devotees wanted to go to some place for distributing books and they were driving super fast to get there in their book distribution van and they met with an accident and several of them unfortunately succumbed, they died. So when the news was brought to Prabhupada, then Prabhupada was asked, you know, was this Krishna's plan? Prabhupada was very grave and Prabhupada said, no, it was their responsibility. They should have been careful. Now, what does that mean? Of course, it was glorious that they were trying to serve Krishna and uh, they departed at that time. So certainly because they were trying to serve Krishna, they will get some elevation because of that. But now what exact degree of elevation and beyond the specific destination, there is a certain level of culpability. What if not now they, they perished? What if they were going for good distribution and they were trying to fast and because of the accident, somebody else perished? So things are complicated. So even when we have an instruction to do a particular thing, doesn't mean that all the other things in our life, which are basically like, uh, you could say common sense, general intelligence, we don't throw them aside. Ajamil had gone to the forest to get um, firewood for his father's yagya. But at that time he saw something uh, and that agitated him and that eventually degraded him. So there was an overall instruction also that even while we are doing service, we have to be careful about what we contemplate on. So it's, uh, it's what we do, it's why we do, and what is the result of it. So all three determine the rightness and the wrongness of actions, the karmic culpability of actions. In the context of the Bhagavad Gita, the focus is very much on the intention. Mm -hmm. But there are other places where consequence is talked about, where content is also talked about. Now, the, the, what we are doing is important. And even from the Bhagavad Gita's perspective, what we are doing, it's not that it's unimportant, See, that Krishna also tells Arjuna, you are a Kshatriya, don't act like a Brahmana. So what we do is important. But the point is, when Krishna is Arjuna, ask, asking Arjuna to act like a Kshatriya, he's telling him that you are thinking that this particular work will bind you, that will not. But what is it about this work that binds? That is, that is your motivation. So if Arjuna, so instead of uh, doing Kshatriya duty, start doing some other duty, that's, that, that can also be problematic because that's not in nature. So in the Gita's context, it's that motivation is very much emphasized, but that doesn't mean intention alone matters. If say, for example, somebody doesn't know anything ABC about treating someone of say doing surgery, but they see somebody in pain and say, I want to do surgery. Well, your intention is good, but if you have no competence for it, then can you really do it? And if something terrible happens because of that, then are you culpable? Well, you can't just wash off your hands and say, I'm not culpable. So I think all three matter. Okay. So there are a few other questions which we'll discuss next time or in future sometime. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. Le Prabhupada ki chai.